Hello. I would like to wish our eighth graders a happy Easter season. We are part of the way into this most glorious season of the church year. And I know it's been a while since we've had these um, these discussions, these lectures, if you will. So what we're going to do today is quickly recap some of the material we've been covering, particularly about the ministry of Jesus. And then from there, we're going to talk about the main topic of today, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So there'll be three parts. The first part is recap. The second part is the death of Christ. And then the third part will be the resurrection of Christ. So concerning the first part, we've been talking extensively about the ministry, the public ministry of Jesus. Now, I'm not sure how much you might remember of what we've discussed, and I would encourage you to rewatch aspects of those videos. But save it to say that one of the key themes that we emphasize is that Jesus came to restore us to God. That was one of the most important themes, that God became a human being so that all humans could be drawn in a closer, more intimate relationship with God, meaning that we have a relationship to God even as Jesus does. And in his ministry, Jesus used various signs. He preached to the crowds about what the kingdom of God was like. That's where the parables come in. That's where the various teaching sermons of his come in. He also performed mighty deeds as signs of God's presence in their lives. And so we see that in the miracles Jesus performed. And we also explored how the miracles are holistic. So if someone is healed, the healing they received wasn't just on a physical level. It was meant to go into the depths of who they are. It was meant to heal them, not just physically, but also spiritually and emotionally or psychologically. So we're talking about a holistic healing here. Jesus comes, and by dwelling among us, he comes to make us whole again. And part of making us whole is, yes, making sure that those who have illnesses, like in his day and age, he would cure the sick. But he also sought to rehabilitate them, to bring them back into society since some were alienated from society due to their illnesses. And also, more deeply, he wanted to forgive them, to give them peace with God. That's the most profound healing that can happen. So, once again, Jesus becomes one of us and begins his public ministry focusing on how he can restore us to God, how he can make us whole. And he doesn't do that just at a physical level, but also at a psychological and social level and ultimately at a spiritual level. Now, this ministry of Jesus is meant to culminate in the cross and the resurrection. And that's where our second and third parts come in. So the period or season of Lent that we celebrated several weeks ago was meant to acclimate us, get us into a disposition that would enable us to enter into Holy Week. Holy Week is, as it suggests, the holiest week of the year. It's meant to be the moment in which we commemorate the death of Christ, his passion, death, and resurrection. Well, his ministry is culminating in this moment, and so we had the season of Lent to put us into that atmosphere of getting ready to commemorate his death. That's why we would sacrifice 
various things during the season of Lent. As a remembrance of how much Christ sacrificed for us. He laid down his life for us and therefore we lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, when we lay our lives down for each other, it normally takes the mode of a kind act, an expression of compassion, gentleness. Doing what we know is right to further the well-being of our fellow human being. That is how we lay down our lives for each other. And whenever we do that, it's important that we do it in remembrance of him. We do it in remembrance of how Christ gave everything for us. So even if we come to the aid of someone else, it only touches the surface of what Jesus did for us. Okay, so having put ourselves in this atmosphere of sacrifice, of giving of ourselves for others during the season of Lent, we enter into Holy Week. Now, mind you, Holy Week was several weeks ago, but we entered into Holy Week to follow the way of the cross. Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday being acclaimed as king by the Jewish people. And it reminds us that the expectations of many people during Jesus' day was that the Messiah, the anointed one, would come as David did, that he would be another earthly king who would establish peace and prosperity for Israel. Now, Jesus does arrive as king. But as he would say to Pontius Pilate later on in Holy Week, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus comes into the midst of the Jewish people as their king, but they don't recognize what kind of king he is. It's important for us to pause here and think of how our expectations don't always coincide with how God fulfills our desires. See, Jesus recognized that if he's going to truly be their king, he has to reach into the depths of the human heart. It's one thing to reign on a starry throne and impose decrees upon people. But that won't inspire awe. That won't inspire genuine love. If one wants to inspire genuine love in the heart of another person and yet be their ruler, you have to come among them as one who serves. And that's exactly what Jesus said. That he lived among the people of Israel not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what's happening during Holy Week. He enters the city as a king, but they don't recognize what kind of king he is. And when they finally catch wind of what is happening, that Jesus is actually exceeding their expectations, but from their vantage point, Jesus is not fulfilling their expectations. It was a zero-sum game for them, either an earthly king or no king at all, whereas Jesus is exceeding their expectations. He is going to be the king of all things, not just in an earthly sense, but he will reign over all creation, reign until eternity, reign to forgive us, reign to offer us nourishments. He is the bread of life. He offers us nourishment forever. So, Objectively speaking, he exceeds their expectations. But because they pigeonholed, they uh, put God in a box, since Jesus was not merely an earthly king for them, he was nothing. It was, it was as if he was a false claimant to be, to be the Messiah. 
And as such, because he stood as a threat to the, to the religious leaders of his day, because any mention of kingship was disturbing to the Romans, and ultimately because he did not meet the expectations of the crowd, even though, like I said, objectively he exceeded them, they did not recognize that. For all these reasons, he was crucified. For all those reasons, he was crucified. It was an inability on the part of the human heart to open itself up to God. So the core of this second part that I'm expressing here is that Jesus wanted to reveal himself as our king, but he chose to make the cross his throne instead of a nice fancy throne in a palace. He made the cross his throne. That was the means by which he ruled or presided over Israel. He chose to be the king and center of the hearts of all those who would follow after him. He chose to be the king of every aspect of our life, not just purely political rule. And the cross is the moment in which he expresses that servant leadership, that servant kingship. And it's in that moment that he gives everything for us, that he's able to bring about atonement. Atonement means to cancel out our sinfulness. He truly destroys our sins because the guilt of them weighed upon his shoulders. And in dying upon the cross, he took the guilt, the sin debt, if you will, and he brought it down to the depths of hell. See, when he died upon the cross, he descended into the netherworld. He descended into hell, as the Apostles' Creed says. So he bore our guilt, our sinfulness in his body on the cross. And dying once for all, he brought that. He destroyed that. He brought that down into hell and left it there forever. That's why death and the sense of the second death, as the book of Revelation calls it, the death in our souls that comes about due to sin, that's destroyed. We can no longer be held in our sins because Jesus bore our guilt. And in dying, that destroyed the guilt. And this gives way to the resurrection. There's a beautiful verse in Psalm 16, which goes like this. You will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor let your Holy One undergo corruption. Well, that describes Jesus perfectly. Jesus' human soul was not abandoned in the netherworld. Think about it. When he died, like all of us, his body and soul were separated. His soul went to the netherworld like all souls do. Well, God did not abandon his soul to the netherworld. God raised him on the third day which happened to be a Sunday, hence why we call it Easter Sunday. But the resurrection is God restoring to Jesus everything that he laid down for our sake. So in dying, he underwent the separation of soul and body that we will all experience in death. And in rising again from the dead, the resurrection on Easter Sunday, everything was reunited. 
So I want you to think of the resurrection as a restoration, as a reunion of his body and soul that were separated in his death. God is making everything complete here. And that's exactly why Paul, St. Paul would say that if he died to sin once for all, and rose to life again once for all, he does not suffer again, then we have the sure and certain hope that when we die to sin, we die to sin once for all. And when we rise from our brokenness, we rise from it once for all. That's why baptism in the ancient church was full immersion. That is to say that you were dunked in the waters. When you were baptized as a baby, most likely the priest or the deacon poured water, holy water on your head three times in the name of the Trinity. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But in the ancient church, when it was commonplace to baptize in, say, a river, they would immerse you. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the first dunk, and of the Son, the second, and of the Holy Spirit. And for St. Paul, that represented how we are dying in Christ and rising in Christ. What happened to Jesus literally is experienced by us symbolically, as one of the saints put it. So think about it again. Jesus died to sin once for all and rose to life in our flesh once for all. And we experience that event in our baptism. We die in the waters of baptism to the old ways. And we rise again in Christ in baptism. What he experienced literally, we experience symbolically through the sacrament of baptism. So I want you to see that for this third part about the resurrection, that the resurrection is about restoring to Jesus everything that he had given. Jesus said in one place that he or she who gives up various things for the sake of the kingdom in this life will receive 30, 60 to 100 fold back. Well, truly, Jesus received a hundredfold back. He gave up his body and soul for our sake as a sacrifice. And he received his body back again in the resurrection. And we, in turn, have the hope of rising again on the last day because we have experienced in baptism a likeness of what he experienced. Once again, we don't literally die we don't literally rise as he did in baptism but we experience a foretaste of how one day we will rise again that after everything is said and done and after in the moment of death our body and soul are separated there will come a time when even as jesus rose from the dead we will literally rise again but baptism is the pledge of that. So I also want to show you in this third part that the restoration that Jesus experienced in his resurrection applies to us. Just like the point about the cross, he died to sin once for all. He destroyed our guilt. So we have the assurance of forgiveness. It's effective once for all. And so also in the resurrection, the hope of new life in him that we have now, that's assured forever. So I hope this has been a meaningful lesson for today. And once again, I want to wish you very happy and blessed Easter season. We're going to be continuing these discussions over the next few weeks. But if you have any questions, please ask your teachers.
and they'll forward them to me so that I could respond as best as I am able to. So in the meantime, blessed Easter season and much peace.